Yeah, I, I'm delighted to actually be able to be here with you guys. Um, I have a natural love of this church, um, you know, largely because I, I love that you have produced a, f- a couple of my favorite people, um, Nathan and Karis, and, uh, and it's always a delight over the last decade or so just getting to, uh, you know, usually once or twice a year we get to share some air, and I'm just always, I think, you, I think you're very fortunate people. I really love those guys. Um, and uh, you've also taken very good care of, of some friends of mine who, uh, who I've known from Winnipeg, and they've just uh, um, been well-loved and well-received in this community. And so my heart for you is naturally very large. Um, but I also feel... Here we go. <laughs> I also feel like here and now a little bit of a lightning rod for the affection of God towards you. Uh, so there's something I believe it's a little supernatural about the affection that I'm feeling right now because I know that God loves this church. I know that God loves this. He loves his church, of course, um, but he loves this church in a very special, unique way. And it's out of that, actually, that I really want to share, um, share this morning. Yeah. I want to start in Matthew 26. Um, Jesus is at the home of um, somebody called Simon the leper. And a woman breaks in to the meeting, and she has this alabaster jar, this very expensive, beautiful jar that's filled with very expensive perfume. And... uh, she proceeds to pour it out onto Jesus' head. Um, and the disciples, Jesus' closest friends, do not understand, and they respond with indignation um, at, the, at the waste of her gift. Um, this perfume could have been sold at a high price in the money given to the poor, right? Right? And Jesus says, you don't, you don't get it. You do not understand what this woman has done. You do not understand how precious and valuable this is to me. You don't understand how she's preparing me for, um, for my most costly gift to you. And you don't understand that what she has just done will be remembered every time the gospel is preached. That's what it says. At, yeah, in verse 13, it says, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Absolutely stunning exchange of value. And, um, and what I felt as I was preparing over the course of the last week, just trying to discern what the Lord might have to say, um, is... This is a, the, the deep encouragement of God that he loves how expensive you are, how expensive your gifts are, how costly they are, um, how tremendously valuable they are to him, and, and that part of that is because, because they have not come freely to you. You have paid a cost for some of the things that you, some of the lines that you have held and and, and held on to and held tight to. You've paid a price for these things. And um, we can sometimes um, become so enamored with, uh, or, or our primary filter can be this extravagant love of God that comes without strings, and it does come without strings, and His grace is freely given to us, that we can sometimes drift into this idea of like a cheap grace, right, where it's like it's all on tap kind of thing. And yet... That, and yet that is the furthest thing from the truth. Just because something is freely exchanged does not mean that it is extremely costly. And so I just felt like the Lord wanted to call that out and to encourage you, to remind you that he has seen the expense of your life. Um, and so if you don't hear anything else, my prayer is that you hear that and that you feel the favor of God 
in that. And so from here, um, I just felt like maybe it would be appropriate to, because I'm a preacher, I'm going to set a timer because that sort of thing is helpful for you and for me. Um, I felt like, just to remind us, and I'm going to say us, because first of all, we're part of a big family, and second of all, because I do not come to you uh, wearing the hat of expert in anything I'm about to share. I come to you as a co in this in this process. Um, but just to remind us what it looks like to live costly lives, because the scriptures are full of these, this exchange, an exchange between people and people, neighbor and neighbor, um, friend and foe, generous exchange in all of these spaces, generous exchange between God and us. Um, we sometimes forget that the, the, the exchange that takes place is a generous one, God deserves all of our praise. There's no question of that. And that. But that doesn't mean that our praise doesn't cost us sometimes. And he celebrates the generosity of our worship. Um, and so we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to be generous worshipers too? Because it's possible to be begrudging worshipers sometimes and to move out of that space. Um, so just some reminders. So when we talk about generosity, when we talk about value, when we talk about the expense of something, what we're talking about is establishing value, right? And uh, one of the most fun things that I get to do in kind of my current working life um, is uh, I, I do get to spend some time around artists, and uh, that's fantastic. I love that. And the thing that's interesting about art, particularly um, visual art, um, is it provides a really interesting metaphor or way for us to look at how something becomes valuable, more or less valuable, right? Um, and so, because you look at something like a painting, like what, what Rick has done, um, and who establishes, the question that I have is who establishes what's, what it's worth, right? Um, and, you know, Rick has an, a going a going number for these paintings. What's your going number? Is that painting even sold yet? Is that one there? Okay, what's your going rate for that? So the, so that's the going price. So if you want to take that home, that's, that's he's charging. At what point does that painting actually become worth? It's probably a steal, actually, just so that we're all clear. But um, at what point does it become worth? Sorry. As soon as somebody pays for it. Um, so there's this mutuality, there's this, uh, this idea that when somebody comes along and they're willing to pay a price for something, it takes on the, 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 the cost of that, right? Um, and that is a steal. I have a friend of mine who, uh, you know, he, he started painting and he was selling paintings in the, you know, for thousands of dollars or whatever. You know, and he would, you know, $5,000, $6,000. And that was what his going rate was until somebody came along and bought a painting for $15,000. And then that was his growing, going rate for a painting was $15,000. And until somebody came along and they thought that it was worth $20,000. And so he is, you know, so there's this process where the value of his work kind of increased based on this thing. Now, the value of his work did not increase to him there was a pricelessness in what his work was. But my point is that when we talk about value, we're actually talking about a, a relational exchange, right? There's a relational exchange that's taking place. And when we start looking at that sort of thing through the lens of the kingdom, um, it becomes, oh. Does anyone know what the cost of, of the kingdom exchange is? Okay, Jesus' blood and everything. Like, what's the, what's, what's the ask? What's the ask of you and I? 
What's God's ask of us? Everything. Now, we, we can go really weird with that. We have, to, we have to understand a few things or that can become extremely oppressive and crushing weight. And that's not the, that's not the way this thing works. But let's be clear. Jesus purchased us. And the cost that he established, we didn't establish it. The cost that he established was that it would be his life. And we could go on a whole other thing about how part of the price was him locking up a portion of the Godhead into flesh forever. But that's a whole other conversation. So from Matthew 13, verses 44 and 45, I want to read this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that a person found and hid. And then because of joy, he went and sold everything that he had and bought that field. Um, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found a pearl of great value, he went out, sold everything he had, and bought it. Um, it's really interesting when we read through these parables of Jesus because when we're reading through parables, we inevitably take the, the role of one. We, we, we insert ourselves, if we're doing the work of engaging the scriptures, we will insert ourselves into the middle of the story. And the role that we take as we read through the scriptures is very telling. For a long, long time, I read those passages as though I was the merchant and I was purchasing the kingdom with my life, right? Or I was the person who stumbled across the treasure and buried it and purchased the field. For a long time, that was how I understood that. And then all of a sudden, I felt like a little knock on my shoulder. When, and that was this beautiful little moment where God said, well, listen, you're my treasure, so where does that put me in this, in this story? Um, and incidentally, I believe that both readings of that have merit. But the question that I want to ask you is, in the equation, and I've sort of given away the answer, I guess, a little bit, but in this equation, what's a particular, let's look at the pearl. The pearl of great price. Um, just read it again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found a pearl of great value, he went out, sold everything he had, and bought it. What is more valuable? The pearl or the one who recognizes it and values it as being worth everything that he has? We can sometimes, as we look at how we value things, we can be so focused on the object that receives value that we fail to to give consideration to how important the buyer is. Because the answer is both. The exchange of the kingdom, all of the things that we would talk about are in relationship. They require relationship. They require two parties that are coming into a transaction. And transaction is not an evil word in and of itself. You know, relationships that are transactional, you should probably run away from on some level, you know. Boundaries are really good. Um, you know, but there is something about an exchange that we're talking about that's taking place here. So again, I just have a series of, you know, just some questions, and I don't know that I have all of the answers. Certainly don't have your answers, because I don't know that we all um, are in the same place in the story. But if the Lord is satisfied and pleased and delighted by the offering that you bring him, my question is, what's the currency? What's your currency? What's the exchange? What's your exchange? You know, and are we the valued? 
or are we the valuator? Again, the answer to all these questions is both. Because there's reciprocity. It's, this is, there's not a one-way converse. This is the beautiful thing about worship, by the way. Worship is focused on God, but guess who God is focused on in worship? That's why it's such a beautiful, fun, joyful experience, because it's not a one-way conversation. Right? There's a reciprocity. There's a mutuality and a humility that is woven into this whole, this whole thing, and we're going to get to why we need humility in it. Um, the reality is we need humility because it's actually out of our brokenness that we tend to pay the highest price. Right? My highest price is not when I um, do something like this, which is moving out of a particular gift set or lead worship or whatever. That's not where the highest price is for me. My highest price, you guys don't know about. Most of you. Some of you might, but So it's rooted in humility. And I think that that would be true of the body here, wouldn't it? <clears throat> so pastorally, look around the world, look around Christendom and North America, because that's kind of my you know, stomping grounds. I look at the church and... Think about what it means to follow Jesus and be a dynamic people who are signposts to the kingdom. And I just ask myself, what, is that, what does that look like? And an interesting phrase popped into my head um, that I'm still kind of unpacking. But it was this uh, question of what, what does it mean for us to be an engaged um, citizenry of heaven? Um, and so that's kind of my big discipleship question right now, right? And my, because we can, like we're not going to get political at all, but, um, you know, when we have an election and not many people turn out for it and people are not super engaged in the process, we're citizens, but are we engaged citizens? Right? The question of engagement is a significant one. So what does it mean to be an engaged citizenry of the kingdom of heaven? Um, and I think that part of the answer to that question, I think, it's a big, I think it's a big question, but part of the answer to that is that it means that we are, uh, on an ongoing way, a people who are actively living in the costly exchange of the kingdom. Um, and it's going to look different for every single one of us. Last week, I was faced with a situation where I could take the easy road or I could take the difficult road. And it involved a conversation that had to do with conflict and being a good Canadian, I did not want to have conflict. And it was easy for me to extricate myself. I could have very easily extricated myself from that conversation. And yet, and yet that was not the invitation of the kingdom. The invitation of the kingdom was that I would have an expensive conversation with somebody. And the kingdom of God showed up in that space. And I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, we can, make, we can make this such a heroic thing. And for sure there are heroic moments, right? Um, but really it's in the dust and the dirt and in the limp of life that we actually walk out what the costly kingdom is. What's the costly way of talking to your kids as opposed to the easy way, right? These are, and there's a million conversations, and that's why we get to sing songs like, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, forgive me for <laughs> what I've done and left undone on a regular basis, right? Because thank God grace is, uh, is a gift. Um, I want to say this. I want to say that the generosity 
is only marginally associated with money. Obviously, that can be part of the conversation, but it is not the totality of the... It's not, it's, it's not even... It's not even a majority of the conversation. In fact, our relationship with, with money is basically a symptom of the rest of the, rest of the generosity of life, to be honest. Um, our, our generosity in, in a kingdom exchange has to do with uh, self-giving life and love. Right? This um, call into... Um, uh, Well, death to self is part of the, I mean, really. That's why it's really important that you remember the, the, the place we started from, because, uh, because this could be a heavy message, and yet God is delighted. Like, this is an encouraging message. I believe it is to be, you know. And, and it's not one of those things where it's like, where somebody gives you a word, and they come up in their prayer, and it's like, I, I mean this in an encouraging way, but you're awful. Uh, <laughs> I've never heard that, but I've, it's pretty close. Um, so I want to tell two stories. Um, one is completely unheroic, and the other is absolutely heroic, because there's a place for both. But just as an example of what I'm talking about, I had this thing a number of years ago um, before I was a pastor, like a pastor um, vocationally, I um, worked in a bookstore in Winnipeg, and, uh, but I found myself in Toronto um, just for some kind of convention or whatever, and I was walking around. Um, it was after our trade show, and uh, so I'm walking down the street, and I have a, a co-worker kind of in tow, and, um, and we get accosted by somebody who's looking for some money, Right? And I didn't, have, I didn't have money to give them. But I just looked at them and said, I don't even know what it was. I honestly, I can't even hardly remember. But it was something to the effect of, oh, dude, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. But, you know, I hope you have a really good night. Like, you know, it was something like really innocuous, right? And just, we just kept on walking. And my coworker was just sort of staring beside me like. And they said something that I found fairly startling. But they said, I've, I've never seen anyone talk to a street person like that. And I kind of, what do, what do you mean? I think part of the thing was that I had actually talked to a street person, perhaps. And didn't just ignore them and walk past. Um, but there was something that took place. There was an exchange of dignity, I guess. I don't know, totally unheroic moment. Um, but it was... The thing is, is that that exchange, I know, existed because of um, a lot of decisions over the course of the year of trying to figure out how to turn my face in, towards, in, in a direction that maybe would be easier to look another way. And so there's something that kind of came out of an overflow moment. And, um, and I just remember being so grateful to the Spirit of God for doing some, some work in me um, that I didn't even recognize as being valuable. Um, and yet somebody else came along and, and told, like, they were startled. It was a strange, a strange encounter. Um, and so this is something about kind of this lateral loving, this lateral, ex, ex, you know, because we're called to love expensively in a lateral direction. Right? Loving our neighbors, loving our enemies, easy things like that. Um, and, and then there's this other, and this is heroic to me. So, um, so I'm a worship leader, and I love to do that. Um, but I went through a journey for a while where I was a little bit confused with the term. And the reason is because, I mean, you know that the term worship leader doesn't exist anywhere in the scriptures, Right? Like, this is not, this is something that we made up. It's something that serves us well, but it's, you know, this is, we've added something in here for the sake of serving a model that God seems to be breathing on in this particular time and season in the human story. Um, but my, my struggle was that that seemed to sort of confer onto me 
a title of being lead worshiper. And I just wasn't sure that that made any sense to me because am I, am I a lead worshiper because I've been given a microphone and a stage? Like, is that the criteria for what it means to... Because I can tell you, sometimes my heart is not in a fantastic place and I'm struggling deeply. Right? Because i got to get up and, you know, anybody who does this knows what it's like to get up and to feel completely unworthy. And, but you got a job to do. You know, and you want to serve. And so I was struggling with this. And then it kind of crystallized for me uh, one morning. And the backstory of this is rather difficult. But uh, we had a family who had just kind of come into the doors of, of the Cambridge Vineyard, like weeks pr- prior. And uh, there had been some uh, good things, kingdom things happening. This uh, mother and daughter. And uh, the daughter was really struggling with some significant mental health issues. Um, deep depression, some schizophrenia. Just a person who was really, really embattled. And um, we had some, I know some people in our congregation had some really intense times of prayer with them. And, and you know, this, this girl, um, young woman, I guess, had received Christ. Um, but in the space of uh, two or three weeks, she ended up in a very public and horrific way um, ending her life. Um, You know, and uh, and so I, I remember I was leading worship, and it was the week. I think it was even the week following. I think it was the Sunday following. It was most certainly within two Sundays of this, but I believe it was the following Sunday. I'm kind of playing my guitar, doing my thing, being the anointed one or whatever. And uh, and I look out, and I see, and I see Betty. I see the mother of this. And you know, this is Betty. She's singing her heart out. Her hands are just stretched out, and she's a brand new believer. She has every reason to tell God where to go and what to do. Like, you know, she has every reason to be very furious. And she's there, and she is pouring her heart out. And it was like a little arrow came over her. And God said, this is my lead worshiper this morning. You follow her. Right? Well, that makes sense to us all. But you know what it was? It was that it cost her everything that morning. Right? That was heroic. It cost her everything to show up. It cost her everything to raise her hands. Powerful. Powerful. Beautiful exchange. Very costly. And quite frankly, a wonderful image for us to follow, to be inspired by, to be moved towards. Because we're all going to have spaces where where God invites us forward and it costs us everything to say yes because we feel entitled to say no. And maybe we've got a really good reason for it. Oh, it's powerful. It's powerful. So, I want to shift a little bit here. Just move into the scriptures again. In 2 Samuel, right at the very end of the book, um, David has blown it with the Lord. Um, He has decided that he, he cares a little bit more about the size of his own army than he does about the protective hand of God. And so he takes a census And I think to our modern sensibilities, that doesn't seem super offensive, but it meant something pretty significant and drastic in that space. And so he counts up his army, and he knows exactly how many soldiers he has and all this stuff. And the Lord confronts him, and and he realizes that he has made a grave uh, mistake. And uh, we're actually not going to go into the consequences, the immediate consequences of that. It's just, that's important, but it's for another day. Um... But there's this passage where um, he, he comes and he wants to purchase a plot of land. And in 2 Samuel 24, I'll just read verses 20 to 24 here. Um, when Aruna looked out and saw the king and his servants approaching him, he went out and bowed to the king with his face to the ground. 
Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David replied, To buy from you the threshing floor so that I can build an altar for the Lord, so that the plague may be removed from the people. Aruna told David, My lord the king may take whatever he wishes and offer it. Look, here are even the oxen for burnt offerings and threshing sledges and harnesses for wood. I, the servant of my lord the king, give it to you freely. Aruna also told the king, may the Lord your God show you favor. But the king said to Aruna, no, I insist on buying it from you. I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt burnt sacrifices that cost me nothing. Now, I think we could probably close the book and walk home and just kind of think about it. I mean, that is, there's a powerful thing that's there about taking ownership and responsibility for our encounter, relationship, life, walk, and journey with God, both as a people and as individuals. I think that there's something powerfully modeled in that. Um, you know, and just, just so that we have a sense of scale and scope, um, this is also the site where generations before a guy named Abraham came up and was prepared to offer his son Isaac. It was right in the same neck of the woods. We don't know if it was the same site, but it was right in that area. And conversely, a generation later, this is the site that the temple was built on. And I find that so interesting, how the hand of God seems to line some things up and bring weight and gravitas, because you know what the, the temple is? The temple is a couple of things. The temple is a place of the overlap of the things of heaven and the things of earth. It's a place where there can be an exchange that takes place, but it is also a place of sacrifice, right? And so you kind of see this this, this movement in three parts. And I have no idea if David was, if David would have known, I mean, I don't think that he would have known that this was going to be where the temple was because this is a future thing. He, being a human being, doesn't know the future. Um, I don't know if he had an understanding of the fact that this was a fairly hallowed place because of what had taken place with Abraham. Possibly, possibly not, I don't know. But it is powerful to me that he made a declaration. He he made a declaration that he was going to bring something valuable, something precious. Okay. Oh, boy. I knew this was going to happen. <sighs> Why does the temple matter in this conversation? The temple matters because um, when it was constructed, it's, it was a symbol of something. It was a signpost of something that was going to take place. And we read from that from the lectionary this morning. Right? When Christ said, you knock this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. He was, he was speaking of his, his life, his, his whole being as being the temple. But the other thing is that he also transferred that language onto us. A place of temple exchange. Now here's where this is really important. And and I knew this was going to happen because I kept on, as I'm unpacking this and thinking, oh man, time. Um, It's possible to get this very wrong, folks. It's possible to get the exchange and how this thing works very wrong, and then it becomes a a, a great oppression on our lives. Um, And it's this. Um, Whatever we bring that's costly and valuable and precious, we are never settling a debt. Your work your sacrifice, you are not settling a debt from that space, ever. Y- 
evil thing. <laughs> you are not settling a debt. This is because Christ initiated this exchange. And in his initiation, he settled all of your debts. So our sacrifices are a response. And honestly, the number of scriptures that exist that support this is just vast. Um, but this is, this is very important. Understanding the exchange, understanding the initiation of God, leaning into the sacrifice, the expensive work of Christ, is what empowers us to do the very difficult work of sacrifice in response. But it is a response. It is a gift. This is the reason why we talk about cheerful givers, and it's not just some slogan so that we feel, you know, sign checks with smiley faces on Sunday mornings, right? It's, no, I'm serious, because we can drift in that, like super easy. No, 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 it is, the reason the cheerful bit is there is because it needs to be a response. Otherwise, we don't get it. And we move back into an earning thing, and then we burn out. And God loves what you do. He loves how you sacrifice, both as a people and as individuals. And his desire is not that you would burn out, but that you would thrive. And um, uh, trying to settle your debts, you're going to burn out because your debts are many. But they're canceled. And so your gratitude is deep. My grat our gratitude is deep. Um, yeah, and I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close up. I've been thinking about healthy boundaries, in particular when it comes to things, because sacrifice is always a noble thing. Right? I'm always stirred by it. I'm always stirred by extraordinary acts of generosity or time. And we champion these things. And so because of that, it's easier, it's, it can be easy for us to move into a place where we are crossing boundaries and getting into unhealthy space. Right? And I just want to share this... this uh, this image with you that I think has is, is been very helpful for me. So I want you to picture a book, like a, an old-fashioned printed, you know, paper and ink book. Like I said, I'm a bookseller, some things die hard. Um, so you open up the book, and I know this is probably a very overused preaching metaphor, but we're going to do it anyways. There are two elements to, uh, to good typography, right? One is the font font size, this kind of thing. The other thing that's crucial to a, uh, to a well-made book, a well-printed book, is that it has healthy margins. Healthy margins allow us to read. If you've ever looked at a piece of, at a, at like um, novels that were printed like generations ago, they didn't really understand this, and so they would go from edge to edge. And reading from edge to edge is almost impossible. It, it's hard work, it's hard to get caught in. When you have margins, you're able to function. You're able to read. It's far easier. It's actually quite dramatic, the, the, the difference. So here's the thing. A lot of people, and I'm not judging you, a lot of people use margins for notes, right? This is not something I do. I grab like another, like I make a note in my phone or whatever because I'm a bit of a like book Nazi. But um, anyway, um, so margins are for, you know, for some people they make notes in the margins. I think that there's something to that. But creating healthy boundaries says that we actually leave the margins as margins and we put the important stuff into the body of text. Right? So cramming, cramming in stuff and trying to do it all on the outside of our life, it's just a very... It's, it's a, it's an expensive way to live, but in, in the sense that you start going into debt. You start going into spiritual debt when you start living out of the margins in that space. Right? And that's not the... God's calling us to an expensive life, but not a debt-filled life. Certainly not for the works of the kingdom. Right? And so, because you are co-authors of your life, 
the invitation, because we're not just reading our life, right? We're, we're, co- we're, we're co-writing this thing with God. So my encouragement as you look at what, you're, what it looks like to be healthy in the midst of this is to leave the margins the margins and to, and to write this stuff into the body of the text. Um, and that just means the decisions, the everyday decisions that we make. So, um, here we go. Two things, love God expensively. Love one another expensively. And as I was praying about what, uh, for ministry, and I know we're going to move into a time of communion as well, which is fantastic. Um, I felt that there were two uh, people kind of coming back to the alabaster jar picture that we started with. And one is this. I, I believe that there are some people here who you have something that you believe is precious, but you're not sure that the Lord will see it as precious. You're not sure that it will be received as precious. And there's fear of offering this thing for, for the fear of being rejected. I believe that the Lord would say to you, I see the value. This is very expensive perfume. This serves my life. This serves me. Your deepest gift will serve Christ. And he cherishes it. And so I believe there's a call to respond in prayer. And I'm not sure exactly how you guys do it, but I'm sure it's like a vineyard thing where there's people who pray for one another. I don't know. But, and, and then the other, so this one set, and then the other thing that I felt was that there are some who you look at the, you look at the, the course of your life or, the, or the, you, you know, take inventory and you don't see anything valuable. You think you haven't been given an alabaster jar. And um, I'm going to mix my metaphors. As a musician, every, every guitar player is looking for the garage sale where they show up. And somebody has like a 1952 Telecaster or something. If they even made them back then, I don't know, but whatever. And the person has no idea what it's worth. Now, I wouldn't do this. I've told myself that I wouldn't do this. I hope to never be tested, actually. And a musician shows up, and they've got a $50 price tag on it. And the thing is worth thousands of dollars. And I believe that the Lord has said there are some of you who have priceless instruments that are thrown under the bed, and they're out of tune, and they don't have any strings on them. But, it, but they are extremely valuable, and I feel like the Lord wants to reveal to you where your alabaster jar is. Again, like I said, solidly mixed metaphor. Love doing it.